Marrying a girl you've only known for a few months is always a risk. Moreover, John had never seen his future bride. He had just returned from abroad. Talek had managed to catch up with his college friends and get some rest after a long stint at work. He had been signing contracts with foreign colleagues after his father decided he had enough of the family business and handed over the reins of the company to his son. John had to figure everything out on his own. He hadn't seen his father much after his divorce from John's mother, who wasn't very friendly, to say the least. His father didn't visit his son or his ex-wife. John would go to see him, since they lived in the same city. However, Mr. White maintained a very good relationship with his son, as if there had been no family conflicts at all. Therefore, he always helped. When John White was still not a business shark, he was 30 years old. He had started running the business in full swing. He had to dive into many aspects and stay late at the office. How else could he manage? The ever-intrusive family lawyer, Mr. Rogers, was very irritating to John. He suspected that Rogers wanted to marry off his daughter to him, a sweet, beautiful girl who sometimes indulged in plastic surgery but was still attractive. However, there was one significant drawback, maybe more than one, John didn't get to know her character or her interests. She was as deceitful and hypocritical as her father. Perhaps the lawyer's grasp is inherited? Sometimes these thoughts amused John. In general, he was quite a reserved person, not one to boast about his wealth or flaunt it. This applied not only to his clothing style and interior, but also to his inner state. When you are so wealthy that it's just your routine, you don't notice or flaunt it. You live like that all your life and don't even think it's worth bragging about. Why? But John could not be called a fool. He had always been very perceptive, erudite, and quite eloquent, and he had experienced life and faced it head on. When he tried to start a relationship, John heard, such a beautiful handbag, I want one like that. The girl clung to his arm, pointing with her brightly manicured finger at a transparent display case. Yes, John understood perfectly well that this girl needed the right kind of care. She wouldn't be dating a poor man. The problem was that she wasn't dating John either. It was their first date, yet another first date where no one even wanted to find out what kind of person he was. He didn't mind spending money. He was upset that no one saw him as a person. He was a very interesting and intelligent guy, having graduated from university with honors. So, one evening in a private men's club, where the walls were paneled with oak moldings, everyone was drinking whiskey in their best three-piece suits, and the lighting was dimmed. His father began to talk about a marriage of convenience. John was intrigued. The girl shown to him in the photo was very delicate, with wavy blonde locks, holding a bouquet of white peonies. Her blue eyes were reminiscent of the South Sea. John even forgot where he was. He kept looking at the photo, as if immersing himself in it, into the presence of this sweet girl, like an angel. Do you like her? His father smirked. Her father's company has always been our competitor, but they never crossed us. The world is changing, and it's better for us to become allies than to waste time, money, and nerves trying to outmaneuver them in the market. And our marriage, its preservation, will guarantee that everyone will adhere to the terms of the deal. John continued to examine the photo. Exactly. She is the only daughter. Lucky she's not a scarecrow, his father seemed amused by his son's reaction to the potential bride. But she's probably just as deceitful as all the others. I was going to ask you to find out more about her to check if they have any secret plans that don't align with ours. I don't want to question Rogers. He's been trying to marry off his daughter for a while, his father waved off. John was upset. Yes, it was an arranged marriage, but he hoped that his bride wouldn't be obsessed with money alone. 
money, money, always money. In such a corrupt world, was there really no one left who cared about feelings, even just 50% of the time? Despite his skepticism about the families and his future bride's genuine intentions, John agreed to the marriage. Then he was unexpectedly called to an overseas branch, and he didn't get to meet his bride. When he returned home, he was caught up in the postponed business matters of the main office. John didn't run social media, gave no interviews, and wasn't into a hedonistic lifestyle. The paparazzi journalists didn't have much to photograph about him. Of course, they saw his apartment in a nice neighborhood, his expensive car, and his branded watches. It was hard to hide that. And he didn't want to give up his usual lifestyle. But what he did, as the CEO and one of the board members of such a famous firm, was unknown to anyone. And so, in his clever mind, a cunning plan began to take shape. His bride, Alice, remained as beautiful as ever, and he decided to find out more about her. Throughout his stay abroad, John couldn't shake thoughts of this beautiful angel. He tried to push them away as much as he could. They were interfering with his work, but he couldn't completely rid himself of them. That evening, he was meeting with a school friend. They saw each other less and less, but kept in touch as circumstances and busy lives allowed. Tell me, you know everyone in our city. Can you say anything about her? John handed over his phone with Alice's photo. They had already had a few drinks, and the conversation was running out of steam. That's when he remembered he wanted to ask Richard. This guy really knew everyone in their high society circle. If anyone could find out about the future bride, it would be him. Their celebration hadn't been scheduled yet, and telling his friend. Why do you need the information? Didn't this Alice girl come up? Well, she's such a wonderful girl. I tried to make a move, but she started discussing Balzac with me. I wanted to suggest going to a club, but decided not to break her heart. I mean, I'm such a catch. How would she cope after our short fling? Richard, as usual, began to boast, but he did it jokingly. Though he was indeed a womanizer, so he knew everyone. They were sitting in a pub. It was noisy, but partitions between tables kept the patrons' conversations private. Waiters dashed back and forth with trays, but were not annoying. John had gotten used to the pace of his hometown. He was tired of being abroad. There was no home, no friends, no parents. And what's she like? John inquired pausing to avoid arousing suspicion with his questions. Kind, very nice, smart, finishing university. But she has some issues there, hasn't accumulated enough hours of public service, and they won't issue her diploma. Remember how we had to work at the dog shelter? By the way, how's your dog doing? He's doing well with my father, so he won't be lonely. And your mother? Also doing fine. I just had to fire the caregiver. She got too cheeky. She was late, slept, left my mother outside, went into the house when it was cold. If you don't keep an eye on them, they stop working properly. I'm looking for a new one, but haven't had any luck so far. I would gladly take care of her myself, but you know, I almost live in the office. You need to get married. Your wife will keep an eye on everything. It's unlikely that a wife will constantly visit my mother and monitor her house and employees. You'd better tell me more about this girl. And why do you want to know? Did you like her? Richard squinted, taking another sip from his glass. She won't be with you anyway. Why not? John was immediately indignant. She's too proper, chaste, and acts like she's the smartest, Richard smirked and ordered another drink from the waiter. And what kind of person is she? John persisted. I can't say anything special. 
She's not involved in scandals, doesn't have a lot of ex-boyfriends, a top student, loves sports, does dancing, and reads books. Got it. She sounds boring, John said, having gathered some of the information he was interested in. He shifted the topic to avoid revealing too much for now. There was no engagement yet. If he uncovered any terrible secrets about Alice, he might never know. That night, back home, he couldn't fall asleep. His mother had been quite down at dinner. John had helped her eat, though it was awkward, but his clumsy care seemed to cheer her up. You seem thoughtful. Is something wrong? His mother asked as he helped her get to bed. Nothing more than usual. I need to find you a new caregiver, John replied. But this time, please make sure she doesn't leave you alone outside in the cold. They say I need to breathe, his mother said. For some reason, she wasn't upset by it. On the contrary, she was very accepting of her condition. The doctors didn't give any predictions. Time would tell. But his mother believed she would get better and had already scheduled new dates with her elderly admirers. Yet, every time John saw her in a wheelchair, his heart ached with hopelessness. And then a sudden thought burst into John's weary mind. He needed to get closer to Alice before she knew who he was, before she had seen his face clearly and got to know him personally. He had work to do, and she hadn't accumulated her public service hours yet, an ideal situation. But to avoid arousing suspicion, he needed to request an interview with the mansion's manager. With these positive, brilliant thoughts, in John's opinion, he fell asleep, though his sleep was light and still filled with worries and numerous tasks. Alice, upon learning she was offered a caregiver position, immediately accepted. According to Mr. Brown, the manager, the girl was incredibly pleased. By the end of summer, she needed to accumulate 200 hours of community service for all her years of education, and the caregiver position was perfect for fulfilling that requirement. John was puzzled that the girl hadn't shown any interest in this while she was studying. But that was her business. Just because she hadn't volunteered didn't deter him from exploring her still partially unknown personality. By noon, Alice's red convertible, its wheels crunching on the gravel and bypassing a fountain with a beautiful marble Greek nymph holding a jug that served as a small waterfall, arrived at their mansion. Alice elegantly offered her hand to the footman, gracefully stepping out of the car. She took off her sunglasses and began to admire the mansion with enchantment. The snow-white house with columns at the entrance, long windows, and fir trees lining the paths. What a wonderful house! Alice began to admire. And what a beautiful apple orchard! Do you like it, madam? The footman inquired. Very much. It's gorgeous. Alice continued to gush and handed over her car keys to have it parked. The manager, Mr. Brown, met Alice and invited her into the house. John, meanwhile, watched like a little boy from behind the heavy velvet curtain of the second floor window. Then, he stealthily approached the living room, where behind closed doors Mr. Brown was conducting what was supposed to be an interview, though it wasn't one at all. Alice had already gotten the job, she was needed here by John, even though he only visited the mansion late in the evening after work. Dinner had even been moved to 11 p.m. for this purpose, and he hoped that this way he could learn more about her. You are suitable for us, but it is important that you also appeal to Mrs. White and her son, Mr. Brown was saying. John listened with satisfaction as Mr. Brown said everything perfectly, just as John had explained. His mother had agreed too, though he decided not to mention that his father had found this bride and that the marriage was purely a matter of calculation. I like her very much, Mom. But I want to be sure of her sincerity and purity of soul. She doesn't know about our wealth, and I ask you not to tell her. Also, don't mention my feelings so she doesn't suspect it's a test. She'll figure it out immediately. 
She's smart, John explained to his mother. In the morning, I'll listen and obey, pretending to be a silly old woman, his mother smiled. His mother had always been cheerful, and her illness hadn't changed that. Alice climbed the grand staircase to John's mother's room, elegantly guiding her slender hand along the wide banister, admiring the paintings on the walls, her heels clicking on the parquet floor. She was dressed in a formal beige blazer and skirt, clearly having come for an interview, even bringing a resume. Come in, was heard from behind the door of the mother's room when Mr. Brown knocked. John had been hiding in the hallway behind a thick curtain, regretting that he could only see Alice's back with its perfect posture. Unfortunately, he couldn't hear what his mother and Alice talked about in the room, no matter how hard he tried. Later, Mr. Brown came out and mentioned that Mrs. White had asked him to bring tea for herself and Alice, and he thought the girl had pleased her greatly. Mr. Brown himself had only had positive first impressions. But John knew from bitter experience that first impressions could be deceiving. His mother and Alice spent more than an hour in the room. Later, when John had dozed off in a cozy armchair in the hallway, the door suddenly opened. Alice, pushing a wheelchair, froze in the doorway. John jumped to his feet, rubbing his eyes, and thankfully was in place. And here is my wonderful son, John. Please meet him, his mother began. Very nice to meet you. Are you the new caregiver? John asked, hoping Alice hadn't been looking for information about him and truly didn't know what he looked like. She didn't seem shocked, just a bit confused, but very friendly and even more beautiful than in the photos. And it's very nice to meet you, sir. I promise to take good care of your mother, she nodded. I hope so. Would you like me to show you how the mechanism works? He gestured toward the stairs, which had a special lift for his mother's wheelchair. I would be very grateful, Alice replied. Alice wheeled the wheelchair, with John's mother smiling slyly, after John. Before long, they were outside, in the blooming, vividly fragrant garden. John's mother asked to be left by a small pond where a family of ducks had settled and for John and Alice to go for a walk and talk. Did she tell you about her condition? John asked, walking with his hands clasped behind his back. No, and I thought it inappropriate to ask her myself, Alice answered. She found out about her last husband's infidelity and suffered a stroke, which left her paralyzed. The scoundrel tried to claim part of the estate, but failed. In the end, he drove our family company into the ground, John sighed theatrically, deciding to play the role of the unfortunate one, but crossing his fingers behind his back just in case. That's despicable, simply awful. Alice immediately looked saddened. Yes, it is dreadful. Unfortunately, I had to declare bankruptcy and sell the company to settle the debts. This mansion will also soon be sold. We're currently looking for a buyer. We'll have to move. That's why I hired you for such a short period, a couple of months, to take care of my mother here without worries. She knows nothing about our situation. So please, don't tell her any of these horrors. She couldn't handle the fact that we'll soon be just ordinary people. And that she'll have to live in a one-room apartment on the edge of town with me? Without servants or even a caregiver. I understand it sounds snobbish, but she's so used to this life and she's no longer young. It would be a blow for her, John made a suffering face, trying to hold back a smile. Let anyone try to touch his business or take away his mother's mansion. But the trouble with her caused by the last scoundrel of a husband was pure truth. There was a bit of truth in his words. Of course, I won't say a word, Alice nodded immediately. Tell me about yourself, please. I need to know who I'm leaving my mother with, John finally began his inquiries, satisfied. Oh, yes, of course. I'm Alice Grow, finishing university with a degree in art history. 
and just when it was time to submit my thesis, I find out I haven't completed enough community service hours. If I had known it was necessary, would I have let it come to this? I'm so grateful to you for offering me this job. But how did you know about my situation? Your dean called and asked me to help. John smiled. Oh, how could I not have guessed? Of course, the girl seemed a bit embarrassed. Please, take care of my mother. She is the only person dear to me. John stopped abruptly and spoke with all seriousness. Of course, sir. I will take care of your mother as if she were my own, Alice replied. John didn't risk asking more questions to avoid seeming intrusive or overly interested in her. If he couldn't avoid this in the future, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but for now, he needed to understand her true self. Unfortunately, John couldn't work from home or return earlier. A new, complex project had started at work, potentially profitable but demanding a lot of time. Mr. Rogers constantly hovered in the office, needing papers signed or mentioning that his daughter was in town. All this exhausted John. He came home late, irritable, hungry, and terribly tired. Alice was already gone, and his mother was asleep. Only the housekeeper, Miss Presley, wasn't resting. She had always waited for John, whether he was a child or now as an adult. Miss Presley warmed up his dinner, always smiling so warmly that it brightened his mood. Of course, while she was checking all the records and the budget for the house, the food order list, he had the chance to inquire about the new caregiver. That's how he learned that Alice had proven herself to be a precise and caring young woman. She worked diligently and took care of his mother, spending hours on her care, reading her books, and talking with her. She also helped with therapeutic exercises and gymnastics, staying present even when the doctor came, monitoring medication intake, and even persuaded his mother to start using the exercise equipment. She understood that his mother needed not only professional care, but also affection and attention. John was astonished. Not only because Alice had shown such attentiveness, but also because no previous caregiver had ever demonstrated such genuine concern for his loved one. John decided he had to check everything personally, see and hear for himself. So he found a free day in his busy schedule and stayed home. Naturally, he did it secretly. Alice arrived on time, bought his mother's favorite cream-filled pastries on the way, and cheerfully bounded up the stairs to her room. John was hiding in the adjacent room, and it was much easier to hear what was happening through the wall. Do you want to watch a movie or a TV series today? What do you like? Alice inquired as they were having breakfast on the veranda. Oh, that's a great idea. I hope that someday I'll be able to go to the cinema on my own, his mother replied with hope in her voice. I don't doubt that at all, Alice said joyfully, while John could only listen to the growling of his stomach and inhale the aroma of coffee and omelet. After lunch, we'll watch something in the garden gazebo. Pick something yourself, I don't know what the young people like these days, Miss Wished said with a smile. After lunch, you have your nap, madam, immediately interjected his mother's personal maid. I'm so tired of this supervision. I'm not dying. I'm actually feeling better, but all I do is eat, sleep, and walk in the garden. Isn't watching a movie bad? Miss Wished sighed sadly. Let's secretly sneak out to the garden and not tell anyone, Alice winked at her and continued sipping her coffee as if nothing was amiss. John hadn't heard his mother laugh so heartily in a long time, and her eyes were sparkling with joy. How are you feeling today? Alice asked as she was taking his mother back into the house. John stealthily followed them. I'm fine, dear, Miss Wished smiled. I can't hear you. Did you forget about your medication, madam? Alice asked, 
and when she received a negative nod, she continued, then let's choose a book from the library and go to the pond. I'll read to you if you want. Wonderful. I love it when you read books to me. It makes my dull days easier, replied his mother. Settling in the garden, John drifted into an afternoon nap, sheltered from the sunlight by the branches of the apple tree. He sat right on the grass and, just like his mother, enjoyed Alice's beautiful, melodious, and calm voice. She read a new book continuously, only pausing occasionally to help his mother take a sip of water. Thank you, Alice. I really appreciate that you care about keeping me entertained. I would be so bored without you, his mother's voice was very enthusiastic. I also enjoy taking care of you, madam. I hope we can become friends, Alice replied. I haven't reread Wuthering Heights in a long time. I used to do it in the winter, before New Year's, sitting by the fireplace. Sometimes John would be nearby. We spend so little time together now, Miss Wish said during one of the brief breaks. He works so much, hardly ever at home. It's sad, Alice observed. Sometimes you need to rest too, Alice replied knowingly. Oh, I don't think he knows how. He needs a girl who will teach him to enjoy life, not just work. Life is so short, youth is so short, and he spends it not always wisely. Tell me, are you seeing anyone? His mother asked slyly. Yes, I have a fiancé, Alice responded joyfully. Oh, I see, his mother immediately looked sad, and John almost broke a branch in the bushes. I was hoping maybe you'd become friends. But why not be friends? But is it possible when I haven't seen Mr. Wished since my first day here? Alice sighed sadly and went back to reading, not noticing Miss Wish's sly look. But John did see it and noticed that his mother did too. So, the next day, he was made to take another day off and meet Alice under the pretext of checking on his mother's well-being. Do you want to win her over or not? It's fine that you want to check her out, but haven't you thought that without getting to know her better, you won't be able to win her heart? His mother's arguments seemed to John undeniable, and he started waiting for Alice to have some free time. You're such a beautiful, delicate girl, John declared. How do you manage such a demanding job? Alice had put his mother to rest after lunch and went out onto the terrace, covered with wild grapevines that beautifully shielded it from the sun. I personally cared for my aunt when she was bedridden in her last days, Alice replied. It wasn't easy, but I'm glad I did it. Now I don't feel like I missed out on her last days. Besides, it's not difficult at all. Everyone in your wonderful house helps me. It's going to be such a pity to sell it. John looked at her stunning figure and envied the thought that he would be very upset if her interests turned out to be merely mercenary. I'd like to know why you chose to be a caregiver. Were there no other offers? John asked. I've always enjoyed helping people, especially the elderly and those in need. I believe that caring for them is very important, Alice answered. Besides, I don't see it as work at all right now. I've found a good friend with whom I enjoy spending time. Your mother has a great sense of humor. I'm glad you like working with us. I see that Miss Wish needs me, and I enjoy taking care of her. I'm happy that I can help your family in some way. It's truly a pity that it's only for a short time, Alice replied. John looked at her, mesmerized by the sunset reflecting in her blue eyes, unable to tear his gaze away from her smile and the way the wind played with her light hair. He constantly thought about her, and love began to slowly take root in his heart. After that, John tried to come home as often as possible, even if just for lunch, where he had the opportunity to chat with Alice about something unrelated. He felt like a complete fool because he mostly remained silent while his mother suggested all the topics, clearly dissatisfied with him. But one day, 
he finally remembered what Richard had said about Alice. Do you like sports? he asked during dessert. Yes, I enjoy horseback riding and tennis. And you? Alice immediately perked up, sitting even straighter, though it seemed like she couldn't sit up any straighter. Just as John was about to answer that he was also into sports, his phone rang. Sorry, I need to go to work urgently, the contact name of his secretary flashed on the screen. His mother sighed sadly again. Days passed, precious hours that Alice was supposed to spend working for the benefit of society, and John had no time to talk to his future bride. How would he look her in the eye later, if they decided to get married? More accurately, when they got married, Alice occupied all his thoughts. He found himself zoning out, staring at his computer screen at work, tuning out half of the meetings, unable to sleep, and when he saw Alice, he no longer even tried to look away, nor did he convince himself it was just because of her beauty or something like that. He was in love, and he was sure of it. John had always been quite pragmatic. He looked at himself in the mirror and thought, why did he even decide to conduct this check? He saw his sad green eyes, his slightly gaunt face from poor sleep, and had no idea how to get to know his fiancée better. He even had his mother find out about Alice's favorite dishes and made sure they were served at lunch. So, that's why you were interested in my food preferences? Alice giggled when she saw everything she loved on the table. That's very sweet. I see, John replied but he still didn't consider this attempt a success. He had noticed that when he was eavesdropping on their reading in the garden, and from the photo his father had shown him, Alice liked peonies. For her next visit to work, he had ordered peonies to be placed in all the rooms she frequented, and then he mustered up the courage to send her numerous bouquets to her home. She didn't reply, but during lunch, she only looked at him. However, John couldn't decipher anything from her strange expression. How do you feel about Alice? he asked one day. She's wonderful, his mother replied as they watched a movie chosen by Alice specifically for Miss Wished. And you're the biggest fool I've ever met. Even your father was more perceptive. All work and no play. Do you think we have a future? She's so kind, smart, well read. And I must admit, she knows much more than I do, John began. She was very upset that she would have to spend the whole summer working, but now she says she doesn't want to part with us, that she really enjoys spending time with me. Even if it's her way of encouraging me or just getting involved, she didn't have to say it. It makes me happy. His mother opened up, and at that moment, John fully realized that Alice was indeed the perfect candidate for his future wife. Behind her well-groomed appearance and aristocratic manners, he saw a woman ready to run a household with him. At first, he might not have wanted to risk his heart, didn't want to guard against the nagging feeling that he wasn't interesting as a person, and wanted to be sure that she wasn't interested only in his money and merging their companies, and that her family wasn't planning any treachery. They saw John and his father as equal opportunities to keep the business afloat. John was astonished by how genuinely and thoughtfully Alice cared for his mother. Perhaps he had violated his own first rule regarding marriages of convenience. He had fallen in love with his future bride, even though she had no feelings for him, as she knew nothing about him. One evening, coming home later than usual, John was surprised to see lights on in many of the mansion's windows as he pulled up to the front doors. Entering the living room, he found his mother's friends, who had apparently decided to visit her. They were toasting with champagne, eating chocolate-covered strawberries, laughing loudly, and John covered his eyes with his hand. They were looking through albums of his childhood photos. What a disgrace! Alice was there too. She was cheerful, her cheeks slightly flushed, apparently from drinking. And how beautiful she looked at that moment. Oh, darling, you're back, and we're having a party. His mother was so happy. 
John had already gotten used to times when this summer mansion was never silent for music, laughter, and the sound of dancing feet. No year had ever been dull. But he didn't expect such a wonderful evening. How are you? Tell the old ladies if you finally found yourself a girl. Maybe abroad, his mother's friends, Mrs. Green and Miss Dempsey, pounced on him with hugs and started pulling his cheeks like he was a child while Alice watched, giggling. John had no doubts about his sincere feelings for this girl anymore. I think it will be a long time before I have grandchildren, his mother's voice came from the couch. Mom, please, John pleaded amidst the general female laughter. After a while, the friends went home, where Alice put his mother to bed and also began to get ready to leave. The hand on the old grandfather clock with the cuckoo had long passed midnight. A light drizzle started outside, and with a heavy sigh, Alice headed towards her car. Maybe I could give you a ride? The roads are slippery and dark. I'm sure you'll be fine, but I'd worry, John offered, following her as if guided by an unknown force. It's very dangerous for a girl to get into a car with strangers. Alice crossed her arms over her chest. Aren't we strangers? John asked, surprised. Well, we're definitely not strangers, Alice winked and headed towards his car. At first, they drove in silence, only the raindrops tapping on the roof and windshield, which the wipers occasionally cleared. The powerful headlights cut through the darkness. The road wasn't very far, but they had enough time to talk. It was the perfect moment to learn something personal, share about oneself, or perhaps confess everything. But words didn't come to John. You're breathing as if you have a secret, Alice suddenly broke the silence with her melodious voice. She made him feel happy. No, I just always breathe like that, he answered, feeling like a complete fool. He was shy when it came to his feelings. I won't test you, Alice gently continued the conversation. I just have a feeling. John tightened his grip on the steering wheel. What feeling? The girl smiled. Do you know that feeling that can suddenly appear when you least expect it? Yes, I know those feelings, John replied, but thought that such feelings weren't close to her. After all, she had said as much to his mother's friends. She kept smiling. I didn't say that, and what I meant to say, it's so difficult, Alice, you know? We've arrived. The car came to a sudden stop. John wanted to complain about being interrupted, but the girl was pointing at her house. They had really arrived. I'll meet you tomorrow, John suggested. No need, I'll take a taxi. Your visits for lunch already take up a lot of your work time. Of course, this is your home. You can be here as long as you want but I still really appreciate that you come there for me. Good night. Alice dashed into the darkness through the rain, covering her head with her denim jacket, splashing through the puddles as if it were not a downpour with wind, but a light mushroom rain. John sat in the silence of the car for a few more minutes, trying to understand when she figured it all out. And he didn't understand. And why hadn't anyone told him before that she had figured it out? In the morning, John transferred all work matters to his laptop and stayed home. He was waiting for Alice. As always, she arrived impeccably on time, bringing her mother a new tabloid magazine and some sand cookies from her favorite bakery, removing her straw hat with a scarlet ribbon, and charmingly interacting with the mansion staff. John had to briefly step away on business to his office. When he returned, the conversation had already started. I think he's not interested in outsiders. He's probably busy looking for extra work right now, said Mom. Alice immediately fell silent, covering her mouth with her fingers. John peered through the crack in the door. What extra work? Mom wondered. Did something happen at the company and he didn't tell me? 
What a scoundrel! John! Mom shouted so loudly that John jumped. He lunged at the handle and opened the door, almost stumbling into the room. John, what's going on? Do you have problems at work, and why didn't you tell me? Tell me, or are you calling yourself Mr. Gone? Mom arched her eyebrows, and if she could, she would have put her hands on her hips. Everything is fine, Mom, said John. Everything is fine with the company, too. And I didn't say I'm Mr. Gone. Alice must have thought so because you call her Miss Gone. Everything is really fine. I'll explain later, but first, I need to tell Alice everything. John collected himself, straightened his shirt, and pointed toward his office. Alice said nothing and silently followed him. Alice, I have a lot to tell you. He waited until the girl sat in one of the leather chairs and then sat down opposite her. His palms seemed ready to sweat and his heart was about to leap out of his chest. He wanted to wait a couple more days, choose the right words, but everything was going completely off his plan. We finally moved to you. Great, I'm listening to you, Mr. White. Alice didn't seem at all flustered. She had a sly and completely incomprehensible smile on her lips, and John suddenly realized the meaning of her words. Mr. White, I don't know what made you think I'm just a silly girl, but do I really seem that foolish to you? I was curious about who my future fiancé is. I couldn't just come to your house, and hiring a private detective seemed a bit odd. I was really interested in finding out what kind of person you are. And then, quite fortuitously, the circumstances aligned so that you offered me a job, which I actually needed. It's just a pity that I never really got to know you. You're a true workaholic, and I don't even know how we'll manage to live together if you're constantly at work. John sat, unmoving, drenched in cold sweat, unable to believe what he had just heard. Alice looked so pleased and had every right to be, she had outplayed him. At least now he didn't have to worry about her misunderstanding him when he revealed that he had checked up on her. And what were you trying to check, Mr. Gone? Alice leaned back in her chair, tapping her fingers on the armrests. I don't think I was actually trying to check anything, John replied. Rather, I wanted to see in you what? In the end? Alice asked, stunned. Well, I still leaned towards thinking that you were testing my mercenariness, whether my family had any schemes regarding your company, as sometimes happens, John answered. John bowed his head at this statement. He suddenly felt ashamed. Not all women are so deceitful. Why had he become so callous? Why hadn't he even tried to trust anyone? I'm sorry and sad, John said. It's so offensive and completely unworthy of a gentleman's behavior. Alice continued, but John found himself at a loss for words again. What words could there even be? You even lied. For a second, I actually believed that you wanted to deceive my father and me, that your company was finished. I'm a liar, John confirmed. I'm deeply hurt by you, Alice said, but suddenly he heard a chuckle. Looking at Alice, John realized she was mocking him. She was quietly laughing and didn't seem so offended after all. I did act poorly toward her, but we still have time to get to know each other. I'd like to invite you on a date, John said hopefully. I'll think about it, Mr. White, Alice replied and immediately got up, heading toward the exit. Okay. I'll be waiting, John said to the closed door. Just as he was about to start berating himself and pulling at his hair, he heard the door open again. I thought. I agree, Alice said, standing on the threshold, still cheerful. Gradually, they began to spend more and more time together. They strolled around the city, went to the movies. For a late night showing, Alice even dragged John out dancing. She turned out to be far from boring, very responsible, 
but also knew how to have fun, just the kind of person who would help him start living life. John did his best to show that he wasn't a workaholic, though he understood that Alice knew about the many tasks at his job and was simply enjoying his presence with her. He hoped that his fiancée could see that she was more important to him than work. Time flew by quickly. Alice and John were happier than they had ever imagined. They were convinced that true love did not depend on wealth or social status, but solely on the emotional connection between two people. They were now completely sure of this. Of course, Miss White was beside herself with rage, which was rare for her, upon learning that the marriage between Alice and her son was to be arranged, a matter of calculation. But, most likely, because it was John's father's idea, her disliked former husband, she always blamed him for everything. Over time, she calmed down and failed to notice how Alice and John were growing closer and falling in love. It was hard not to see how their bond deepened. Mr. Brown, the manager, continued to praise Alice's clever plan for a long time, noting how she managed to achieve her goal and proved to be much more astute than John, who fancied himself the smartest. But John was ready to admit his mistakes and acknowledged his defeat in his hasty judgments about people. Everyone was happy with their union, except, of course, for Attorney Rogers, who was so infuriated that he began to constantly bother John with his investigations into Alice and the entire Grove family, digging into their past to find something that might discredit her or convince John that she was unworthy of his attention. However, when Alice learned about the attorney's attempt to sabotage her relationship with John, she decided to take action. She started looking for information on Mr. Rogers herself and found a vulnerable spot, his ex-wife. Alice contacted Rogers' ex-wife and discovered that he had left his family to live with another woman. When she reported this to John, he immediately decided that Mr. Rogers could no longer be their family's trusted lawyer. Mr. White, John's father, was shocked. It was a huge surprise and disappointment for him, as Rogers was the only attorney he had truly trusted all these years. But John didn't care. He had already heard enough about how Alice had a questionable reputation and that marrying her would significantly tarnish the White family's standing. Instead, the attorney suggested his own daughter as a potential bride for John. John could not believe that someone could be so foolish as to insist he marry someone he didn't love but was proposed by the attorney. However, it was no surprise. Mr. Rogers was known for his dictatorial nature and for making his family go against their wishes. But in this matter, he lost. John and his beautiful fiancée sat together in the garden, talking about their dreams for the future and their love for each other. Alice radiated ease and light. Her heart was full of love, just like John's. He was sure of it. They knew they had found their soulmate and never wanted to lose each other, oblivious to the passage of time, consumed by their love. And that morning, when Alice came in to wish Miss White a good morning, she could flex her fingers, finally feeling like a future daughter-in-law. I hope to see your dance at John and my celebration, she said. At Alice's wedding, she wiped away tears. In such a short period, Alice had become a true friend to her. She sat down by the bed and, taking a deep breath, began her story. I remember, I was 22 or maybe 25. I had a suitor then. Miss White sat beside her, listening as Alice reminisced about the past. Outside, dawn was breaking, and it was truly beautiful. The sun shone like a golden disc, winding along the sky and slowly rising. 